please try to help uh, everyone convey the message that we're all in this together. Hello, I'm Faith Rogers, host of today's program, COVID-19, Keeping Up with the Moving Target. This is the July 1st update of DKB Med Radio's Coronavirus Educational Series. Thank you for joining us. This activity is jointly provided by the Postgraduate Institute for Medicine, DKB Med, in the Institute for Johns Hopkins Nursing. Today's program is accredited for ANCC, AAPA, and AMA PRA Category 1 credits. Please visit our website for complete accreditation information. To attest for credit, please visit us at covid19.dkbmed.com. There you will also find all of our previous COVID-19 programs and have access to other free CME and CE programs on a wide range of topics. The slides for today's webinar and previous webinars can be found under the resource tab. Today's learning objectives are Discuss the current trend in three-day rolling averages of new cases. Describe the results of CDC's seroprevalence study and discuss the implications of the conclusions of the seroprevalence data. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Pfizer Incorporated and in kind by DKB Med. All activity content and materials have been developed solely by the activity directors, planning committee members, and faculty presenters and are free of influence from Pfizer Incorporated. With us today, we have Dr. Paul Allwater, Clinical Director of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Thanks for your time, Dr. Allwater. Thank you, Faith. So this week, over 10 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 worldwide uh, is unfortunate mark that's been reached. But more concerning on the domestic side is nearly 50,000 cases now are being diagnosed every day. And this is now higher than at any time, even in the beginning of the pandemic, which has created grave worries by many. And many have commented on the need to maintain the same maneuvers that allowed cases to decline. But interestingly, I think if there's 50,000 confirmed cases every day, really what's going on with how many cases are not diagnosed? And I'll just say that for the first few months, I personally, in terms of my personal family and friends, didn't know anyone that had COVID-19 disease. In the past week, I now know of two people. So it does seem like this is becoming more prominent and uh, in many states, and I think your patients may be hearing more that may get them concerned. But despite this, I would say people are still looking at, well, states are opening up and relaxing. There's lots of questions that come up that I think clinicians may need to field. Uh, one question uh, last week was, uh, you know, I hail from New York City and need to visit family in South Carolina. Should I go? How could you advise that person? In fact, now New York City might require quarantine for 14 days if you're going to a state which is concerning with new cases. And another query was uh, someone attended an outdoor garden party, uh, but someone at that garden party has developed COVID-19. What should that person do if they got tested and they're negative? Can they just go out? Does that give them free reign or do they need to stay in with a 14-day quarantine? I think there's a lot of misconception because the right answer to someone that may have been exposed at a party, even if it's outdoors and at lower risk, is that you should have a 14-day quarantine regardless of your testing. Another was the same confusion about what tests mean, the molecular viral RNA tests and nasopharyngeal swabs. You know, an 18-year-old wants to hang out uh, with his friend at another person's house, but this friend's mother was COVID-19 positive, but the boy that same day tested negative, and, and can he come over and stay at our house for the weekend? And, and again, a negative test does not mean that it's the all clear. Attack rates in a household may be 20%, but one of the difficulties 
are that one person can be a super spreader and affect many more, uh, you know, 10, 20 or more, and others don't infect anybody. So this is very unpredictable. And so if you've had close contact with someone that in your household, especially, it does warrant you to stay home until uh, you're sure that the incubation period is passed. So in terms of travel, uh, these are some things that I look at briefly to try to give people some guidance. Do states have increasing frequencies of infection? And many of those now in the news you've heard about, including the states in the southern tier, including Florida, South Carolina, Arizona, and Southern California. And, uh, and other states have been static to keeping very low rates. So Obviously, if rates are declining, there's going to be less tendency towards community spread, at least for the next few days. And on the other hand, rising rates are very concerning. The other aspect that you may want to take a look at is the percent pauses, because you just don't want to look at the total number of cases, because that can vary with how many tests are being performed or limitations in getting tests. But if you look at the percentage, uh, the WHO has established 5% as a goal for regions and states and provinces to try to have a percentage below that, which would reflect less tendencies towards community spread, especially if those rates are declining. But instead, what you see off to the right are the very high percentages of tests, namely the states that we've just discussed that would give one some pause before going there. But you might say, well, how bad is that? You know, it's 10 or 20 percent really bad. And well, no, it's not terrible. It's not awful, because if you look at New York City, those rates were as high as 70 percent in the earliest phases of the epidemic that hit the United States and North America. But uh, at the same time, testing was quite limited and people were very circumspect and you had to fit case, to, you know, definitions to get tested. Now it's much more liberalized, which is why this 5% definition has sort of come into play. But even so, if you look at how New York City is doing now, they are definitely below 5%. And I think it's because they've, they've been through this. So people know the importance of trying to avoid contracting the disease. Many people are asking, can I get an antibody test? And can that show whether I've had it, whether I'm immune? And unfortunately, we've talked on this program before, the current antibody test for someone that has a low pretest probability of having had COVID-19, you're more likely to get a false positive than a true positive information. We just don't have the tests for antibodies specific to the SARS coronavirus 2 specific enough yet with doing one, two, or three different antigens that are being assayed by an antibody to really give you that assurity like we do with the HIV that a positive test test is real. So the CDC, though, for surveillance purposes, for population purposes, this antibody test is fine because you're looking for relative rates that would inform what's going on in communities. And so they grab blood from a Quest and LabCorp that were being done for other reasons, you know, diabetes and cholesterol and wellness visits in six areas, Connecticut, Southern Florida, Missouri, uh, New York City, in the metro area, Utah, and in the uh, northwest state of Washington. And they had nearly 12,000 people. And this was, you know, a convenient sample. And this is only available as preprint for the moment. But I think you can see that with this antibody test, when you use the population, I think it does speak to some reality where you see New York City had nearly a 70% seropositivity at that time, lower in Washington at the same point. So it gives you an idea that in a way, New York City was ahead of Washington, even though Washington got the first cases that really hit the news. And then you can see as you've moved along the x-axis and with time into April, uh, rates of 2 to 3% are being generated, but Connecticut falls a little higher. If you look at breakdowns in each of these areas, I, one thing that impressed me was, you know, you'd think, oh, it must be the elderly that had the highest rates. And of course, they get their blood tested a lot, right? More than younger people. But if you look at the percentage who are positives, it was really younger people. And in a way, this makes sense, right? So we think older people are at risk of becoming symptomatic and so on. They're less likely to, you know, if they do turn ill, go out and infect others. But younger people may be asymptomatic symptomatic and spread this. And I think this seropositivity sort of speaks to that in many regions that you see here.
the take home points that Fiona Havers, who I have to say trained at Johns Hopkins as an infectious diseases fellow and is now uh, working in the respiratory and influenza division down at the CDC. And of course, everyone there is working like gangbusters with the pandemic. They have concluded that based on regions and confirmed cases that infection rates are six to 23 times higher compared to what's being reported. And on average, the thought was about 10 times if you look at the initial epicenters in, in you know, the Seattle, Washington area or the New York City metro. So the thought is there's a high rate of milder asymptomatic infection. There's some caveats because of course, when you're testing just blindly, some of these are gonna be false positives, but probably not a huge percent. Even if you divide it, take it down by 20 or 30%, it's still meaningful to look at the differences and, and you really have a large number of people that are infected and why this virus is so easy to spread. So this just, I think, reinforces a message which I think so many of us have been trying to tell our patients, but really, I, I can't tell you how hard it is with family and friends to convince them, as best as I try, to wear a mask when you're in public and can't maintain enough distance, uh, that you should always maintain social distancing, practice hand hygiene, and then if you are exposed, or you have a close contact, you need to quarantine, you need to self-isolate. And I think that number four is unfortunately quite lost in public health messaging right now. And especially people run out and get a test because many times you don't need a doctor's note, there's not any counseling, you get the test, find the results negative and people think they're in the free and clear. And that is probably not the case for many who have uh, had recent contact. So I wanted to close, I had read an obituary recently that Milton Glaser, who's a graphic designer, died at the age of 91. He developed the I Love New York logo that is of course uh, still used to this day, but he was quite ill, but uh, with the COVID pandemic wanted to put something together and use the term together that he thought might speak at the moment, not only to the pandemic, but I think also to some of the social issues that are uh, really just front and fore after many years, and importantly so, that we are all living together on this landmass, and the only way we can really try to uh, get beyond this is working together, trying to understand messages and behaviors that can keep people healthy and respectful. And, you know, I don't know how far this together will go, but um, it speaks at many different levels and, and is different than a lot of the media messages that we're hearing in so many venues. So, uh, Faith, I think uh, we have some questions that might coming up today. Thank you, Dr. Alwater, for those updates. We will now continue to the listener Q&A. Dr. Alwater, this is our first learner question. How soon after exposure will an individual typically test positive for COVID-19? Yeah, so if you're going to develop it after a contact, the information suggests the average is five to six days that you'll develop symptoms. Um, and the range is really two to 12 days. And that's uh, similar to what we think the, the case will be if you're asymptomatic, although we're less certain of that. And so that's why the 14 day quarantine comes about to give that comfort for several reasons, because if you test positive or have a close exposure, we know that unless if you're hospitalized and critically ill, most people are generating good antibody responses by day 10 to 14. We can't culture the virus anymore. People are not thought to be infectious. So you unfortunately do have this rather long period where you have to be careful with who you interact with uh, so you don't transmit this to someone else. And just because you test early, a, a positive is helpful because it can tell you that you may have to do some contact tracing. So uh, basically people can be infectious a day or two before they develop symptoms. So uh, these are all things which I try to assess every time that a patient asks questions along these lines or they get testing uh, after a close contact. Thank you. Our next question. What are your thoughts and opinions about the Journal of American Medicine's Greek Colchicine study for COVID-19 patients? Yeah, so this is one of many studies that have uh, 
examined agents which might have some impact on the hyperinflammatory phase or the cytokine storm-like phase that some patients experience with this novel coronavirus infection. Uh, you know, this study was small. It was open label. It looked at 100 patients who were hospitalized for COVID-19. And, you know, they looked at some biochemical endpoints like CRP and troponin. They also had a seven-point scale clinical endpoint, which uh, is probably most important. It's also important, besides being open label uh, and introducing some bias, many of these patients were also on hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine or azithromycin. So a small study, but any study, I think, that can be performed during a pandemic is really just remarkable. So uh, hats off to these investigators. However, this study intervened after three and a half days of hospitalization. So it was on the later phase. And they feel that colchicine was able to help slow or prevent clinical deterioration in more patients on colchicine than the control arm. So this might be something very similar to the dexamethasone arm of the recovery trial, where if you are using anti-inflammatories of any kind, even if it's uh, rather blunt, uh, that this may be helpful because you get an over-vigorous inflammatory reaction that's actually harmful to organs and therefore the patient. So it's something that needs further study, and it's unclear if you were to give additive uh, medicines. If you, what happens if you combine colchicine with dexamethasone? Is that any better? Um, you know, these are all things we'll have to look at. Um, certainly did not see a danger signal, which is important, uh, and that's compared to hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine, which we now know in very ill patients is probably not wise. Okay, and this is our last learner question. I recently read an article that showed some promise using low-dose radiation to combat the cytokine storm. What are your thoughts about this approach? Yeah, this was an interesting question. I had to go to the books. Um, so there have been a couple of articles in the radiation oncology and radiology literature about this. And uh, it appears that uh, if you go back to the pre-effective antibiotic year in the 1930s, low-dose radiation was used as an immunomodulator for patients with pneumonia, uh, apparently with some salutary effect. So the idea is that you might irradiate the lung, which would sort of stun or render uh, white cells, which are usually quite metabolically active, being less so uh, or causing them to apoptose and die. I think that's the reality. Uh, I think people may be sort of unhappy about being uh, exposed to radiation, but it's an interesting approach. Of course, now we have dexamethasone, some other information. I don't know if we'll see the light of day. The other thing is, you essentially have to bring people into a room and there's a lot of infection control issues. So I don't think this will be a widespread uh, approach just because the logistics is an interesting issue though. Okay, great, thank you. As a reminder to claim credit, please complete the evaluation at covid19.dkbmed.com and select today's activity. You'll receive your certificate immediately after. Any questions or issues, feel free to email us at the address listed. To submit questions, please send them to qa at dkbmed.com. That's Q as in question, A as in answer at dkbmed.com. Don't forget to access our resource center at covid19.dkbmed.com. You'll find a range of information, including the latest COVID-19 data and statistics, medical society guidelines, and resources in Spanish. Again, thanks for joining us and thank you for your dedication to your patients with COVID-19. Thank you again, Dr. Allwater. Thank you, Faith, and thank you for listening. Uh, please stay safe and well, and, and uh, please try to help uh, everyone convey the message that we're all in this together.